we're not looking for mountaintops. We may be unaware, we may forget, we may be misled, but in our hearts and souls we know we are not looking for mountaintops. What we're seeking is different. What we're seeking is the space between the top of the world and its baseline, the ceiling and the floor. Sure, we may trick ourselves into thinking it's the top or the finale or the view, but as has been said before, if the goal were truly the top, we wouldn't bother ourselves by climbing. We'd be dropped off at the top by helicopter. No, we aren't looking for mountaintops. What we want is undoubtedly the climb. We live for that climb, that immersion into life where we are alive, awake, that quest for purpose where humans are transformed and life adjusts to stop feeling like a standardized test and start feeling like a canvas waiting on a masterpiece. Simple, yes, easy, no. It's Nietzsche and Frankl's meaning through suffering. It's Peterson's choosing your sacrifice, Simon Sinek's finding your why, it's Goggin's staying hard, Grover's becoming a cleaner. These aren't parts of the journey, they are the journey. Mountaintops are meaningful simply because they remind us that we could have said no and didn't. They allow us to remain conscious of our courage, what we overcame and who we became along the way. In the view, it allows us to hold on to that realization just a little longer before setting out for new mountains to climb. But knowing the person embarking upon the next journey will be a little wiser, a little stronger, a little more polished. As Jim Rohn said, it's not success we're after. It's what the pursuit makes us along the way. That's why Eckhart Tolle says the adrenaline-seeking pursuits, such as a climb, are so powerful because we're forced to be in that moment to understand what living is. We can't be pulled down by the past or diverted by the future. We are immersed in what matters. Transformation happening in real time. Because something can be made out of nothing. But mountaintops don't do that. Elevation through blood, sweat, and tears does that mountaintops are symbolic of what we become every time we pull ourselves a little higher. They stand for a million little yeses in a world of no's, just like the trophy is nothing more than a celebration of trials and tribulations. Hearing the crowd roar when you rose to the occasion, finding ways to win when the odds were stacked against you, becoming more when it felt like there was nothing left. Don't let life trick you into thinking it was ever about the hardware or the trophy case. It's not. Any more than swimming on a beautiful day is about drying off. No, it's the middle. It's where we are forged from fire. It's where we map our destinies. It's the game of life. So remember when you do feel tired or weak or lost or can't seem to find your reason to carry on, that you can't see it now because you are entrenched in the most meaningful of experiences. You are, in fact, at the heart of what you'll look back on and realize to find you, the center of transformation, of meaning. Remember that idea that if mountaintops were the goal, we wouldn't climb, we would get dropped by helicopter. This journey, with all its ups and downs, is life at its fullest. It's why you're here. It's why you must keep going. In a commencement speech, Ed Helms references character from The Office, Andy Bernard. 
and his perhaps most defining quote, I wish there was a way to know you were in the good old days before you've actually left them. Well, my friends, we are right now in the business of making good old days. Don't wait for any metaphorical mountaintop to look back and realize how precious, how powerful, how perfect the ascent truly was. Let's look at this one simple singular concept. You can always be doing more than you're doing. Whether you're sitting there or whether you are in a world of hurt, going through hell, there is a way to level up. There is a next level. There's something more. There is the next stair in the staircase. And sometimes we just simply need to be reminded that because the default is comfortable. Even when you push yourself, you push yourself to a level you've never pushed before. Well, guess what? The ceiling becomes the floor. Your new normal, you adapt very quickly. And sometimes you need that whispering in your ear, hey, you're comfortable. You can do a little bit more. You can always do a little bit more. There's no rule that says you can't be one second faster. There's no rule that says you can't push a little bit harder. And you know, that message I keep in my back pocket because every time I draw from it, I improve. My life improves. And, you know, if you have aspirations, which I know everyone listening to this or watching this does, right? That, that's it's why we watch this content. That's why I create it. That's why you guys do what you do. We want more. We know what we can get from life. We know that infinite pool of possibility to draw from so why waste it? And the more you get that reminder, no matter what you're doing, hey, there's more in you, period. That will never be a false statement. There is more in you. And, and I'm, I'm really implementing that right now into the creative aspect of my life. I went from one video every 10 days to one every day. And there's a growing pain. And, you know, sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's you know, it's, it's, it's tough to be able to create at that level, but the reward is through the roof. And you know, the, the, the change, it occurs quickly. And I was talking to someone about it and he says, well, that'll be nothing when you're doing three a day. And it's like, that's the way you need to look at the world. There's always more in you. And if you don't remind yourself of that, it just goes untapped, right? Like, again, I could easily see a situation where I just put out one video a day or one video every 10 days for the rest of my life. I'd never know. I'd never know what that other door could unlock. So whether it's running, whether it's work, whether it's at home, whether it's a relationship, whether it's something you're building, whether it's something you want to create, whether it's something you want to stop doing, you can always be doing it a little bit better, a little bit faster. And that's what this video is about. And I hope you remember that. I hope this is that whispering in your ear that you need, you know, to remind yourself, hey, you know, I'm operating here at a fraction of what I could be doing. I'm tiptoeing right now. I could be sprinting. So I want to start with a story um, about cliff jumping with my friends. Maybe four years ago now, we flew into Las Vegas, spent some time in Vegas, and then we hit like national parks in Utah, and then Arizona, and went all the way up the coast when we were in Lake Tahoe, at the very end, there was this spot to cliff jump. This really, really high peak. And, you know, it's notorious, and it was just like a, a scary thing. And, and I remember walking up, there were three of us, and two other people were there. It's like you have to hike up to it. It's kind of in the, in the woods a little bit. One of my buddies walked up, and... You know, we thought he was going to jump right off. And he stood there and he looked down. And he looked down for, I don't know how long, a while. 
you know, ultimately jumped. As far as I knew, I wasn't afraid of stuff like that, right? So I walk out and, and I look over the edge and I could not bring myself to jump. Physically, I couldn't do it. Rationally, I couldn't speak myself or talk myself into it. There was no more rationality going on. It was just, I was frozen in fear. And I just remember sitting there and looking down. And, you know, people would come up and ask about it. And they'd be like, you know, can I jump? And I'm like, go ahead, right? Like it, it almost got to the point where it was, it was hurting my pride and I still couldn't jump. And, and I just stood there, and I stood there, and I stood there. You know, I forget how long it took. I don't really know, and, and time was probably felt insane in that moment, but eventually I did, and it was incredible, right? It was a forever long drop, and just the adrenaline and the excitement, and you realize for a second that type of thing that's peak living and there's more of that out there in the world and, and all of a sudden you want to capture it and obtain it and you realize what you had been missing you know and then my friend came up after me he stood there for <laughs> for just as long too right it, it's just it's a very weird thing and it's hard to explain there are so many situations that are this peak in our life, this cliff that we know we need to jump from. We know the other side is better or we suspect, but we can't bring ourselves to do it. And this all came from uh, a quote I found from John Green, one of my favorite authors. In, in his book, Paper Towns, it says, it is so hard to leave until you leave. And then it is the easiest goddamn thing in the world. And that's right on the money, right? Being on the edge of that cliff, it is terror, sheer terror. It is so hard to make that jump. And then you do and it's like life opens up. And it's the same thing with in this case, right? It's so hard to leave until you do. It's terrifying to uproot to change, to go somewhere you don't know. But once you do, life opens up. It's incredible. The other side is beautiful. And it's, 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 it's waiting for you. All of this is coming to a single point, a rule that I use to guide my decision making. And the rule is simple. If you are not content where you are, that is your reason to jump. Because on that cliff, rationality dissolves. The future is unknown and it's scary. And how are you gonna logically talk yourself into a scary unknown when you're at that point? You can't, it doesn't make sense. And I think that's why so many of us are scared to make that jump. And we ultimately turn back and we concede and go, okay, I'll just stick with what I have. This isn't great, but it is what it is. I can't bring myself to make that jump. Right? We're all there at some point. I've been there. I've been there with speaking. Big cliff for me when I first started. Ultimately jumped and, and you know, put me on a trajectory that changed my life, right? Same thing with making videos. Same thing with my first client. Like all these things, uh, they're terrifying. And in the moment, you can't logically speak through them, so you just have to go. And it's like, well, how do you logically explain? You don't, you just go. Because if, if the present, here's the rule, if the present is not making you content, go, jump, right? Never forget that the path, the, the, the future is, is comprised of a trillion paths and you can bend them and shape them and remake them. And sometimes it won't work. Sometimes it'll, you know, blow up in your face. But again, you're still presented with an opportunity to adjust and remake and bend and reapproach and continue forward, right? The only way to lose is to stay on that cliff 
for the rest of your life. And so if you needed some type of rationality, if you needed some type of reason, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe I can give that to you today. If you are not content where you are, jump. Because somewhere along the way, you'll figure it out. Every time I've jumped, it's changed my life for the better. Maybe not immediately, but ultimately. And as I say, that's what life's all about. So. Hey, I hope you got something from this podcast. If you did, please subscribe, rate, review. It helps me get it out to the world. And guys, I appreciate that. And I will catch you tomorrow. Welcome to Your World Within Daily. I'm Eddie Pinero, and in this episode, we're going to talk about a little parable about an elephant and a robe and paint life's limitations in a slightly different light. So in this parable, there's a man and he's walking through a circus. And what he's noticing as he looks around, he sees these massive elephants, right? I'm sure everyone knows how big and strong an elephant is. They have a rope around one of their legs connected to something, and that's what's holding them in place. And he's looking at them thinking, how are these enormous creatures being held in place by these little ropes, right? They could easily... Uh, you know, have enough strength to just break free and run around. Yet they're not. They're all staying right where they are. And so as he keeps walking, he finds someone and he asks them, you know, how is it these elephants are, are constrained like that? And the person explains, well, when they're little, we do the same thing. Right? We take a rope, we tie it to one of their legs, connect it to something. And at that point, they are too small. Uh, they can't go anywhere. And every day... You know, we do the same thing. And as they get older, they don't realize that they're big enough or strong enough to break free. Right? They maintain the idea that they're shackled by that rope or tied by that rope, that they're bound to the same place. It's mental. Right? And in fact, most limitations are mental. These elephants don't even realize their constraints are self-imposed. And if you take a, a step back, if you look at your own world, I think what you'd find is there are more of these ropes than we'd like to admit. And changing that is, is one, awareness, and two, a willingness. Like what types of parameters have you made for yourself? Are you living in just because that's what you've always done? Right? What is your metaphorical rope? Is it a job? Is it a relationship? Is it a, a routine? Is it the courage to start something? Like what, what is holding you back? What stories have you told yourself? Are you living by that dictate your actions and your days and ultimately your happiness that can change with a tug on a metaphorical rope? See, reality, your life is nothing more than what you've conceded to, what you've allowed it to be. It's a line in the sand, right? And the message today is so incredibly simple. It's to look around you and pinpoint where those lines can be redrawn, where that rope needs to be pulled. What invisible walls have you created for yourself? Because in life, there's one truth, right? Things only stop when you do. Life stops when you decide to stop. And sometimes you realize it and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you need the reminder to look around you right, and realize how courageous you are, how much you're capable of if you see beyond the immediate. Because reality was not destined to be. It's what you've allowed. It's what you've created. It's what you've accepted. So let's tear down those walls and build something incredible. Have an amazing Saturday. Catch you guys tomorrow.
What exactly are you afraid of? What's holding you back? As the giant rock you inhabit spins through the universe, a speck in a galaxy of stars, it's easy to look out and see the vastness of the world around you and forget entirely about the strength that you possess. Forget entirely that the mind's capacity is as infinite as those same stars that surround you. I don't think it's that we definitively choose to sell ourselves short. I think we simply lose sight of the fact that we have a say in the matter to begin with. Our fears keep us wishing, our insecurities keep us hoping we stay standing still when we should be moving forward. But truth be told, our pain comes from not doing, but wishing that we did. It's no coincidence that the more we fail, the more we realize life is a game that expands as we push. The power of making mistakes isn't the mistake itself, it's that when we get back up and brush ourselves off, our cognitive mapping of the world changes. We see that we can step out a little further. Our very definition of what's possible expands, and I believe that's what courage is. The willingness to step into that chaos of life knowing that each time you find the strength to push forward, you are restructuring your reality. The resources are there, the tools are there, the opportunity is there. How crazy is the fact that we just need to convince ourselves that more is worth it? That the difficulty of short-term vulnerability isn't an enemy. It's the very ticket required for admission to the show. And so I ask again, what are you afraid of? Falling? Because you will rise and you will rise stronger than you ever were. Is it criticism? Because one, people are so focused on their own endeavors that they look up way less than we think they do. And two, other than the small group you surround yourself with, why would you care? Is it pride? Because building things of significance requires starting on the ground floor, and there's no shame but honor in breaking down to build up. And when I look at my life in terms of chapters, right? Childhood, high school, college, 20s, 30s, the things that were my biggest concerns during each chapter are now laughable. And maybe, just maybe, if I saw that, I could have lived a little freer, been a little bolder. What if we were to get ahead of that learning curve? What if we understood that life is beautiful and flexible and exciting? And what if we understood that now? Instead of looking at this chapter 15 years down the road and chuckling to ourselves for not having the courage to have made the leap, taken the chance to have moved out into an unknown. We cannot physically see that which doesn't exist. Which is why it's so important that we know we are the architects. That the fear pulsing through our veins is indicating that we are building. That we are choosing to step into a world that will give more if we find the courage to ask. So as this giant rock you inhabit spins through the universe, a speck in a galaxy of stars, Perhaps each little light up there exists not to remind you how small you are, but to remind you that those same elements exist within you. To show you that the fire of a million suns sits in your soul, beats in your chest, waits for your signal now. So what are you afraid of? The little E 
on the car dashboard reminds me that I'm pointed east. As I sit at the red light, perpendicular to Ocean Ave, staring out at the water, this is it. This is as far as I can go. There are no more streets or towns or cities. There can't be any more stops along the way, just miles and miles of ocean. And it's interesting for me to think about all the changes I've made up to now, growing up outside of Los Angeles on the opposite coast, relocating again and again, sometimes very targeted methodical moves, sometimes just for the sake of change, but always moving, always going. There's a saying that wherever you go, you take yourself with you. Right? You can change the scenario, the circumstances, the surroundings, but ultimately, you can never outrun yourself. You are accompanying you on whatever journey awaits. And it's often not until you run out of real estate, until there's no more road or options, that you're forced to look in the mirror and acknowledge that it is you who must change. It's you who must evolve and become that person that you need you to become. And that can be a scary thing. After all, anyone can get in a car and head east. Anyone can point the compass away from the chaos of now move away from their demons. But how many of us can find the strength to look those demons in the eye? How many of us can make ourselves bigger than what attempts to weigh us down? All of us can, but how many of us do? Are we running to something or from something? Because there is a difference, and that difference is not small. One of my favorite speakers, Jim Rohn, when referencing our journeys through life, our push to make more of ourselves, he essentially said, it's not what you get at the other end. It's who you become along the way. And I think, like everyone, I've forgotten that from time to time over the years. Forgotten that value is not simply in going, but in becoming. In the courageous little steps that accumulate over time. Forgotten that the external world might inspire or excite. That change might invigorate the soul. That the road untraveled might remind me of life's beauty, but these externalities are only as valuable as you allow them to be. They're only opportunities if you decide them to be so. Change inspires. But will you let it inspire you to do that thing you know you need to do, but are terrified of doing? And that road, it might remind you of life's beauty. But will you let that reminder be your invitation to share your own beauty with the world? Whatever that means for you. Can you be that vulnerable? Can you take that leap in the story of your becoming? See, it is incredibly easy to look out at the world and pinpoint its flaws. All those little problems and imperfections, they tend to jump out at us. But can you identify what you, yourself, need? Can you be courageous enough to ask those questions of yourself? What matters to me? What does a meaningful life look like to me? Where am I falling short? That is a conversation that needs to be had and it needs to be had often. Otherwise, we will drive 
and drive and drive until we hit water and are forced to ask that question. Because it's interesting that when we don't pause and make the changes that need to be made, life has a way of ensuring that we do. But when it's mandated by life, it tends to be a lot messier, a lot more chaotic. At least than when we make the decision ourselves. But either way, we cannot run forever. Either way, we must step into a new pair of shoes and learn to walk confidently with them into the night. There are plenty of little mantras floating around out there, little pieces of advice, and perhaps it's best for us to weigh them each individually, see what meets our needs and fits our criteria. After all, life is not one size fits all. But one of my favorite among these is to do one single thing that scares you every day, and I'll tell you why. Because when we become conditioned to turning our backs on all the uncomfortable things in life. We cripple our prospects of a better tomorrow. It's synonymous with the seed refusing water, saying no to the very thing it needs most. And what should be noted here, one of the reasons it's so dangerous, is that saying no is incredibly subtle. It's not some big event or explosion. There's no fireworks show that occurs every time you walk away from what you need. No, it goes unnoticed. And again, one of the greatest challenges is quantifying that which we don't do. How do you measure that thing you walked away from? Well, unfortunately, you can't. You can't, at least until you're staring out at the Atlantic with nowhere to run, no more escaping on the agenda. You don't know until you're forced to pick the pieces up and make something of them. And I say this so that hopefully it can ignite that spark in your soul that you need most, whether you previously recognized it or not. I say this to remind you how much bigger you are than your problems, how you have the ability to transform all that exists around you when you transform yourself. There's a certain inevitability associated with how we see ourselves. And I believe this to be true at both the personal and the societal levels. Anyone can look in the mirror and see the past where they've gone wrong, how inadequate and ill-prepared they are. But the courage to look in the mirror and see strength, to both identify and understand one's shortcomings, but know that you have the power to do something about it. To know that the times you fell or didn't make the cut, they don't indicate that the endeavor was all for naught or unequivocally wrong. No, there is so much good tied into your pursuit. So much beauty and courage ingrained in your soul. But imagine, imagine a life where you no longer run from the gaps, but close them. Imagine finding it in yourself to begin that hero's journey. And where you used to run to protect yourself, now you take the offensive to grow yourself. Where you used to avoid the possibility of failure, now you chase the possibility of victory. You can have that if you want to. You can be that if you choose to. And sure, you may never be able to outrun yourself, but you can always adapt yourself to be that person you always needed you to be. Sometimes we just need the reminder that we are strong enough. We do have what it takes. And that the thing that hurts us most in the short term not only saves us pain in the long term, but it becomes what we live for. It is where we find our meaning. 
And so perhaps this ocean before me is not there to remind me of my constraints, that I have no road left, but a reminder of just how often we measure using the wrong metrics. Perhaps I needed to see again that it's not where I end up, but who I become along the way. That when the internal self steps into the shoes it's been too intimidated to wear, that when the world within becomes the beacon you need it to be, the roads and the stops along the way, they matter a little bit less than the eyes that process it all, that decide what it means, how it will be utilized in the game of life. And so, yes, the little E on the car dashboard, it says that I'm pointed east. But as I sit at this red light, perpendicular to Ocean Ave, staring out at the water, I know this is only the beginning. What does it mean to give 100% effort on something? Is it possible to say with absolute certainty that you couldn't have done better? How do you know that you couldn't have run one second faster, done one more rep, scored one point higher? How do you know that there wasn't more in you to give? In terms of human potential, there is no such thing as a limit. It's a fabricated, completely negative, debilitating idea. So why? Why in a million years would you put obstacles in front of yourself that aren't there? In reality, you can always be one step better, one step further than you are now. That's a fact. And simply knowing that knocks down walls. It opens doors for you to make moves, to progress. Warren Buffett has a great quote on maximizing effort. He's speaking from a business standpoint, and he says the one thing that is absolutely sure to kill a business is complacency. Being comfortable with where you are, thinking that your current effort is sufficient, that it's enough. It isn't. And if you get comfortable, someone willing to pay a steeper price will come along and take what's yours. And there is always someone working hard to do just that. When you think about your dreams, what you're striving toward, I'm sure you have some plan, some routine, day in, day out to get there, to make it happen. Maybe you're moving forward, maybe you're in a rough spot. But regardless of your situation, there are positively untapped opportunities to move quicker, to be better. And these opportunities, they just sit there. And they'll sit there for an eternity if you don't recognize them and utilize them. I'll use the example of an athlete. When you break it down, an athlete's work is comprised of physical training, you have the mental component, their diet. And to say you wanna be the best is one thing, but if you can't strip down your goal into these simple components and ask yourself, how can I be a little better in each area? You know, you won't grow to the level you're capable of. You won't be the elite athlete. You're missing the key ingredients to success. Even sitting on the couch watching TV, you know, it's a normal thing. We all do it. You unwind, you relax for a few minutes. 
But think about taking that half hour and reallocating it. And instead, sending three emails to people you know, who have been successful in your field, whether you know them or not. You know, who have done what you're trying to do. See if you can connect, have a valuable conversation. Maybe it results in nothing. Maybe it creates a relationship that changes your life. Who knows? But I can tell you for damn sure that the TV will not do that. And this is an arbitrary example. But I think it's an important one because it shows that if you truly want something, you'll use every opportunity to get better, even the little ones, because every second is a game changer. Always be asking yourself, what can you be doing differently? What can you be doing better? Never be content with where you are. Be analytical. Be searching for the next step because there is always a next step. And realizing this is just the beginning. There's a quote that states, life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it which means that your reaction is drastically more important than the circumstance. And that's critical to know. It's critical to understand that nothing, no one in life has more power over your own situation than you. And there's an old story that, that hits on this point exactly. There's a father and a daughter. And Basically, the daughter's complaining. She's complaining about life, how difficult things are. She doesn't know how she's going to make it uh, in whatever it is she's doing. I mean, the, the bottom line is she's tired of the day-to-day, -day, right? And her father gets this idea. He says, come with me into the kitchen. And he gets three pots of water, puts them on the stove, and turns the burners on. As soon as they start boiling, he drops a potato in the first one, an egg in the second one, and some coffee beans in the third one. And after some time goes by and they boil a little bit, he pulls them out, right? He puts the, the potato in a bowl, he puts the egg in a bowl, and uh, he takes a ladle and he puts some of the coffee in a, in a cup. And he says, what do you see? She says, well, I see a potato, I see eggs, and I see uh, coffee. He says, yeah, but look closer, there's more there. And she goes and she touches the potato and it's now soft. And he hands her the bowl with the boiled egg. And she takes the shell off and, and breaks it open. She sees that it's hard inside. Then finally, he asks her to take a sip of the coffee. And, you know, she smells it. She takes a sip. And a smile comes to her face. She says, so what does all this mean? What are you trying to, to say? And he says, well, the potato, when I dropped it in the water, it was, it was rigid. It was tough. It was uncompromising. But in the boiling water, it became soft, weak. Then you have the egg that was basically the opposite. This delicate layer protecting a, a liquid center and the, the boiling water made it hard. And then there was the coffee. That wasn't just changed by the situation. It created something new. It took the same adversity and used it as a lever to bring something beautiful into existence. He then looks at his daughter and says, look, when things become challenging, when things become difficult, which one are you? What's your approach? See, maybe the question is not about how challenging the situation is, right? Maybe we've been asking the wrong question. Maybe it's how do you transform yourself and by default, the world around you? How do you take your strengths, your values, your loves, your joys, your happiness, and let that lead you into something bigger? When life gets hard, and it does, what do you become? I always remind myself, you know, we are not defined by life at peak state as much as I wish that were the case, right? We're not shaped by the easy days or the times that we floated by. 
Because those times are great, they're enjoyable, but they're not what make or break us. It's the times that challenge us and ask us to be what we have not yet become. That's the good stuff. And this is another one of those, you know, simple but not easy type things because on paper it makes sense, it's understood. But it's an outlook that manifests over time. It's slowly stacked piece by piece and brick by brick, realizing that every situation provides you with tools to make something out of an apparent nothing. And then it waits. Right, because fate is in your hands. And, and I can certainly think of, you know, times in my life, that's one of the reasons I love these stories, I can reflect, where each one of those pots of boiling water was relevant. Right? I can think of times I was too headstrong, like the metaphorical potato. I thought success would be easy. I thought projects would be simple to execute. I spent months doing things that just weren't good because I didn't ask what does the world need? I ask myself, what do I want to give the world? And there has to be a marriage there, right? And it was a quick reminder that the world owes me nothing. I was humbled or softened, as the story goes. I've been the egg, I've been timid, I've been uncertain, thin-skinned, worrying about what people would say or, or the content I was creating, worried about perception. How would things look if, if, if I failed? And very quickly, I learned that when life is a game of comparison or one-upmanship, when you do things for reasons and people other than yourself, you can't win. You overcompensate. You do things for the wrong reasons and you lose yourself. You become hardened. And then there's the good stuff, right? Getting to the coffee, not bowing down to the circumstances, but shaping them. Not letting life dictate how the story goes or the fate of your character. And what's interesting is I'm pretty sure that being that metaphorical egg and the potato, they lay the foundation to become the coffee, the life lessons, the falling down, the picking my ego up off the floor, learning to trust myself, not be led by the opinions and expectations of others. You essentially learn that you can take the world around you and change it, that it is malleable, it is flexible. You have that power, you have that ability, it's up to you to believe it. And that's critical because no one comes along and co-signs that understanding for you, it's an internal process. You start to learn that things aren't there to provide instruction, they're there to propel you. But can you see the unknown as the opportunity, the obstacle as the way, and the loss as the armor that you pick up during the journey? And so, you know, all of these words essentially come to one point. And that point is you have so much more control over your life than you think you do. As I've said before, you are stronger than you think you are. You are more resilient than you can even imagine. And when life tests you, and again, it will, remember that the challenges are not happening to you, but for you. The world isn't taking away what you have, it's giving you what you need. So long as you're willing to adapt with it, to grow, expand out, because you not only have the ability to change yourself, but the world as well. Why is this battle you versus you? With all the complexity, all the obstacles out there, why are you your greatest opponent? Well, to put it simply, because all those obstacles, 
and all that complexity still can't tell you no. They can't say enough is enough. They can't look back at you and say, let's just settle for what we have now. No, only you can do that. The world may create the landscape. It may construct the terrain and those obstacles. But you are the sole decider on where along the way you stop. You decide how far you want to go and how much you are willing to endure. When it comes to your advancement or limitation, you are in the driver's seat. I just picked up a, a copy of Will Smith's recent book, and one of the ideas that stood out to me was resilience. And this part in the book, it's actually kind of uncomfortable to get through, but incredibly powerful. He's talking about his childhood and the polarity of his father's personality. A man who would do anything to provide for his family, he took pride in that and saw it as his primary responsibility but simultaneously was their greatest source of pain. And he mentions his father you know, hitting his mother from time to time. And one particular example struck his mother in the face so hard that it knocked her on the floor. And as she stood back up, she said something along the lines of, you can hit me, but you can't hurt me. And that was the first time Will understood as a child the difference between uh, what the outside world inflicts upon us and how we choose to react to that occurrence. That understanding is power. That's why you are the author of your story. In the sense that every single thing dropped at your feet, every situation, every occurrence, they come with an implicit question attached, a question that you and only you are responsible for answering. The question is, what does this mean? And how you respond to that question determines whether you go left or right at that metaphorical fork in the road. Does the occurrence detract from your ambitions or is it a multiplier? Does it confirm your doubts and insecurities, or is it your reason to rise to the occasion? An opportunity to stretch, to evolve. That's a gift. That's an invite. Not some sort of divine punishment. But the challenge is removing the layers until you arrive at the value. And it's hard. But you get there by saying yes. You get there by choosing to see the value. And here's a, a quick example. My favorite thing about athletics, which was for me a ton of running. Now I throw uh, more interval training in there, but the same concepts apply. It's a chance to remind myself that I don't negotiate with my weakness. I don't give myself an opportunity to rationalize with the voice that wants me to quit, that question, that fork in the road, I answered it. I charted its course before the workout started. Knowing this is going to be uncomfortable at times, but it's where I need to go. There will be no more thinking from here on out. And so today's workout, for example, switching deadlifts, burpees, to squats, to core, you don't think. You see the next requirement, the next task, and you simply say, yes, you don't need your mind for this. In fact, you go before your mind even knows where it's going. Because that dotted line has already been signed. And that was the breakthrough for me. When you separate what you have to do with the hurt associated with doing that thing, you free yourself. After all, what's there to hold you back if you can't talk yourself out of doing things? See, we tend to think our greatest adversity is the pain or the confusion or the unknown. But it's like, no, those are the byproducts of doing anything of significance. The adversary is the voice that begs you to slow down 
because of those things. And if you can figure out in your own life how to create space between the two, how to separate the task and the discomfort often brought about by the task, there's nothing that will ever be able to slow you down. And look, I'm not saying that you walk around without ever utilizing the power of that brilliant mind you possess. The one's ability to think is everything. But what I am saying is there is a time to shut it off. There is a time in which to avoid overthinking, we simplify. Action, reaction. One more mile, okay, end of story. One minute of jump squats next, roger that, period. It's taking the emotion out of the process, refusing to leave the door cracked for the inner dialogue that says, hey, maybe you don't do this, maybe you slow down. Are you sure you can handle what's next? No, all of that is tuned out. It's assignment, go. Next, go. Next, go. You know this is the right thing. You did your thinking before grabbing the sword, shield, and stepping into the arena. Now guess what? It's instinct. It's doing what has to be done. And what has to be done hurts. And look, you didn't have to accept that. You didn't have to step in. You could have stayed home, but somewhere along the way, you looked in the mirror and said, the difficult path is the one with the value. And now here you are, face to face with hungry lions, clashing swords with your adversaries. There's no turning back now. Now is when you parse out pain from the objective. The pain is now part of the audience. It's not with you or in you. It's watching from above as you do what you came here to do. So yes, those swords clash, but the eyes remain focused on what's ahead. And yes, those lions roar, but that's background noise. When you simplify your world into objective and action, objective, action, objective, action, there is time for nothing but forward progress. And sometimes that is all that is required of us. In the face of adversity, in the face of pain, self-doubt, in the face of discomfort, can you break your world down into nothing but one single step forward? One more set, one more rep, one more session, one more attempt, just one more. No rocket science, no negotiation. There's nothing to figure out here. It's walking the path before you. It's the discipline to carry on. It's one more swing of the ax. Audience or no audience, lions or no lions, you are bound to the universe at your feet. And that simplified concentration is why you will succeed.